Hello, my name is April Frazier Kamara, and I am president and CEO of National Legal Aid and Defender Association. I want to say wel welcome to our CAC virtual roundtable on UN Goal 16. I just wanted to begin by sharing a little bit of background about the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, better known as NLADA. NLADA is the oldest and largest nonprofit association devoted to the excellence of the delivery of legal services for those who cannot afford counsel, whether in a criminal or civil matter. We have been fighting for over 111 years to pioneer access to justice at the national, state, and local level in multiple ways. First, we have helped build many of the public defender systems across the country. Many of the first systems that we take for granted today is the norm NLADA played a pivotal role in establishing those public defender systems within America. In addition, we also helped to establish the Legal Services Corporation and also develop national standards around the delivery of legal services for low-income individuals. And we continue to advocate for groundbreaking legislation. 30 years ago, NLADA created the Corporate Advisory Committee under the leadership of Clinton Lyons in partnership with the Ford Motor Company. And for the last three decades, NLADA has been collaborating with distinguished legal executives in the private sector from a wide variety of industries to help low-income people in need of legal services by expanding and strengthening pro bono programs, formulating national strategies in support of legal aid, and also supporting resource development for NLADA to lead this work on the national level. We are excited today for you to hear from some of our amazing leaders within the CAC community. You'll hear about their work. And also you can think about ways that their work can serve as a national model for you to support equal justice around the globe. So it is my great pleasure on today to introduce our moderator, Jim Chosey, who is the current chair of the Corporate Advisory Committee. Jim is the Senior Executive Vice President and General Counsel of U.S. Bank Corps. In his role with U.S. Bank Corps, Jim oversees of the fifth largest commercial bank in the United States being responsible for their legal affairs. He is a member of the board of NLADA. He also serves on the board of the Gulf Three Theater, the Fund of Legal Aid, and the Board of Counselors for the Equal Justice Works. Jim, has he is a life fellow of the American Bar Foundation and a prior exemplar awardee for NLADA. So it is my great pleasure on today to introduce and to bring to this virtual stage, Jim Chosey. Thanks so much, April, for that uh, lovely introduction. It's great to be here. And I just as well want to add my own thanks to everybody who's joining us for this conversation to talk about the CAC and its work and also uh, goal 16. We're really excited to host this uh, conversation as we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the CAC. And uh, just to amplify on what April said, the, the NLADA has a really long history of working with the business community through its corporate advisory committee, which was, as noted, founded way back in 1992. And its purpose really was to try to institutionalize corporate America's dedication to the principle of equal justice and explore different ways that the corporate sector can help ensure access to counsel for people that uh, otherwise could not afford representation across uh, the country. The roster of the Corporate Advisory Committee, if you look at it, is really a, a terrific list of blue chip companies who work with and support NLADA and its work. 
And uh, that list includes some of the companies that are represented here today, of course, including U.S. Bank, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Entergy, among um, very many others. Um, the CAC itself doesn't issue statements or poly policy positions of its own, but the members uh, work together in several different ways. They provide financial support to NLADA. They also act and serve as ambassadors for the organization. Uh, individuals like those on the panel sign letters uh, to federal and state uh, officials, including the Congress, uh, supporting different measures to fund legal aid and also public defense. And then finally, they engage in partnerships and, and pro bono work to try to expand access to counsel. So you may wonder why we do this kind of work, which is probably somewhat outside the traditional lane of many corporations in terms of what they do and what some of their legal departments do. And I thought I'd just share a little bit of perspective about, about why we do it and why it's important to us. And if you think about it, um, access to counsel is really fundamental to our system of justice. Without that, our system cannot work as intended. And it certainly can't work uh, equitably for those that it impacts. And having a strong equitable system of justice is, is foundational to a, a strong society and strong communities. And those communities are where our employees and our customers live and work and corporations cannot thrive uh, unless the communities in which they live and work are thriving. And we think equal justice is really essential to a thriving community. So it's really a business issue and a business imperative as much as any other. And that is why we're here today and why we do this work. Um, in 2019, there was a project launched uh, called the Goal 16 Working Group, which we're now going to talk a little bit more about, and that is a public-private collaboration uh, that is intended to advance uh, equal justice and equal justice policy. It's named after United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 16, uh, which is actually one of 17 goals that were established by the UN in 2015. And they were designed to cover a, a really broad range of social and economic development issues. And taken all together, these goals emphasize the importance of progress on uh, trying to develop and foster peaceful and inclusive societies. The goals also contain different targets and indicators of progress. And in specific, Goal 16 tries to address peace, justice, and strong institutions by focusing on providing access to justice for all and trying to build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions really at all levels. So the Goal 16 Working Group uh, was formed further to that purpose, and it's actually officially registered with the UN. The UN has a Sustainable Development Partnerships platform uh, in which organizations can, uh, can register and they can identify and track uh, the work that they're doing. So our working group is actually a registered uh, part of that platform. There are over 800 uh, such groups registered of which our working group is one. So today's roundtable, we're gonna showcase uh, some of the successful collaboration that NLADA does with the private sector through the Corporate Advisory Committee uh, in the areas of public policy, uh, legal reform, and also pro bono activities. So the purpose of this, we hope at least, is that this work, the things that you're going to hear about, can really serve as inspiration for others of you, uh, whether in the civil uh, sector or the business sector, who are interested in doing simil similar things, launching uh, public-private collaborations further to the work that we're going to describe to you today. So with that, I'm really excited and delighted to uh, introduce the panel that we have uh, uh, with us today. It's really an incredible collection of leaders. And I know you're gonna find uh, their remarks and their experiences uh, not only interesting, but also inspiring. So first up, we have Christy Kane uh, from Entergy. Christy is the pro bono counsel at Ener Entergy. Um, where she works with in-house lawyers to find pro bono opportunities and also support uh, those lawyers if they need assistance during the representation or, or participation in a particular project. Uh, Christy previously served as the executive director of Louisiana Appleseed. She's a member of the Louisiana State and also the Federal Bar Associations. She's also a leader in the equal justice community and she received the New Orleans chapter of the Federal Bar Association Camille Gravel Award for public service. 
Uh, finally, she's a fellow of the Louisiana Institute, Institute of Politics and the Louisiana Bar Foundation. As well, she's a member of the Supreme Court of Louisiana's Access to Justice uh, Commission. So Christy, welcome to you. We're delighted to have you. Uh, next up, we have Hardy View, uh, who serves as the Chief of Staff for Kids in Need of Defense, uh, the acronym for which is KIND, K-I-N-D, uh, where he works with the executive team to lead the organization's uh, strategic programming and, and new initiative work. Uh, he's a lawyer by background after several years in uh, private practice in Washington, D.C. Uh, he previously served as senior uh, vice president of legal programs at Human Rights First. Uh, in addition to his day job, he serves on the board of visitors of Duke University's Sanford School of Public Policy. He's also the past president of the National Duke Alumni Association. He served on the Duke University's board of trustees from 1999 to 2013. And finally, he also serves on the board of the National Institute of Military Justice and also the DC Scholars Public Charter School. So Hardy, thank you as well for joining us. Delighted to have you here today. Uh, next up, we have Joanne Wallace. Uh, Joanne is the relatively new president and CEO of the NLAD's mutual insurance company. Previously, Joanne was the president and CEO of NLADA. Uh, Joanne's leadership in the equal justice uh, world spans decades, uh, literally. Her advocacy career includes both uh, civil legal aid and public defense. And she has been recognized by the Obama White House as a champion of change for improving access to quality legal representation. She previously served as director of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. And during her years uh, as the leader of NLADA, she was the co-founder of the American Council of Chief Defenders, and it, which is an NLADA leadership section aimed at elevating the voice and the role of public defense executives as co-leaders of criminal justice systems really across the country. And then more recently, she uh, helped to establish the Black Public Defender Association as the newest section of NLADA. So Joanne, good to see you, welcome. Glad to have you on the panel with us today. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, we have John Schultz. John is the Executive Vice President and the Chief Operating Officer for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where he heads up a number of functions, including operations, legal administrative affairs, uh, which comprise things such as the traditional legal department, uh, the ethics and compliance office, the data office, global IT, global real estate, corporate affairs, and also global security. So John is quite busy in those various capacities. Uh, before joining HP, John was a partner in the litigation practice at Morgan Lewis, where he focused on complex litigation and primarily was engaged in defending consumer class actions, uh, fiduciary liability cases, and also uh, technology-related commercial uh, disputes. John currently serves on the board of the Law Foundation of the Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley, and he's also a board member of NLADA, and he served as the past chair of the Corporate Advisory Committee. So that is our panel, and as you can hear, a terrifically experienced uh, panel of experts, and I'm very excited to introduce them to you and to invite each of them uh, to share more. So with that, uh, John, you're gonna lead us off. I'm gonna turn it over to you and you're gonna talk a little bit about how business can advance public policy and legal reform, and in particular, as it relates to our efforts on the Legal Services Corporation uh, funding campaign. Yeah. So with that, John, take it away. Well, thanks, Jim, and it's great to be with all of you and, and including uh, such esteemed panelists, and, and, and thanks for your time. Um, I think you covered uh, quite well why this is a business imperative and not just, um, you know, sort of a legal imperative and why, you know, companies like ours have remained engaged in this fight uh, for equal access uh, to justice. You know, I assume most of the folks on this call are sort of generally aware of the justice gap and what's involved, but just as a brief reminder that if you were to take a look at uh, LSC's uh, 2022 justice gap report, um, they have found that low, uh, low income Americans receive little to no assistance for more than 90% of their civil, civil legal problems, right? Think about that. These are housing issues, education, healthcare, 
safety, et cetera, you layer on top of the, um, the impact of the, of the pandemic. Um, and you can imagine we've seen a dramatic spike in things like evictions and foreclosures, domestic violence, family law issues, and the like. And yet we sit in a country right now in which people think of health care as a fundamental right, but do not think about legal aid as a fundamental right, despite the significant consequences that many of the actions I just described will have uh, in, that com in our communities uh, in which we are asking people to go forward in a legal proceeding designed by lawyers uh, without a lawyer just doesn't seem like you know it meets the the basic rules of fairness as jim said you know as companies we have an obligation that go beyond the bottom line in our shareholders and i'm proud to say that at hewlett packard you know we've got 75 years of history of, of leadership that has focused on the dignity of our employees the dignity of the communities that that we are a part of and, and the overall society in which we live and that ethos continues and runs through what we do in terms of how we try to support the efforts of NLADA, the LSC, and many other organizations uh, in the U.S. and outside the U.S. who are fighting for um, justice. Um, as Jim said, um, it is the right thing to do, when it, and it's an imperative. But even on a very selfish basis, I can tell you, having spent now the last dozen years of my career traveling around the world and you know being engaged with different parts of our company in which we do business in more than 100 play, 100 countries in the world our legal system our rule of law our approach is a competitive advantage and it is what allows us to be successful in the global marketplace there are many parts of the world in which the basics rule of law are not still present. And so if we don't protect that, if we don't nurture that, if we don't create a system in which our employees, their fam family members, the people who buy our products and services, the people who support our efforts, if they don't believe the system is fair, then that competitive advantage will be will be lost. So what I think it's the right thing to do. I think you do it because that's what companies are, are intended to do is to support their employees, support their communities and like. But even if you just take a bottom line dollars and cents perspective, if we do not protect the system, if we don't make it fair for all, if we don't close this justice gap, I think we will lose a really important competitive advantage um, in the world. So we do that through pro bono and very, very active pro bono, as I said, in the US and elsewhere. We have been instrumental in trying to lead the efforts to continue to make sure there is full funding for the efforts of LSC by uh, leading the way in terms of generating general counsel and other business support for the LSC funding efforts. We also do it so through something we call our Living Progress Initiative, which is our ESG, um, Focus, which is also an organization in, in my group, um, and thinking holistically, not just about sustainability and climate and things of that nature, which are obviously critically important today, but thinking about access to justice, thinking about the fairness of the places that we do business, and thinking about making the opportunity available for all from a legal perspective. So I see the um, clear benefits to the company, to our employees, to the communities. And uh, I am so thankful that there are organizations like NLADA that are there to help us channel our energies, magnify our impact, and hopefully you know, continue to make a difference in closing this justice gap. So thanks, Jim, for the opportunity. Thanks, April and Joanne in, in, in your past for, for the leadership at NLADA, and so great to be with you today. Terrific. Thank you so much, John. So appreciate your leadership on all fronts. Um, so next up, I'm going to ask uh, Christy and Hardy to uh, take the mic and talk a little bit about how business contributes resources to the access to just, justice community 
and implements uh, sound business practices to further uh, access justice, including through, importantly, pro bono work. So Christy and Hardy, take it away. Yeah, so hey, um, Jim, and thank you so much, everybody, and NLADA, happy birthday to the CAC. Um, at Entergy, we are excited to be part of this group. Uh, Entergy is a Fortune 500 company that is headquartered in New Orleans. Uh, we provide electricity to about 3 million customers in Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas. Uh, our legal department, we have about 75 lawyers, about 75 support staff, in eight offices in five states, the, the four states in which we provide electricity and then DC, um, we have some regulatory attorneys there. Um, the company has had a great culture of community service and giving back. Uh, I, I believe that it's, it's we are a natural monopoly. We do provide electricity uh, here. And so I think it's even more important to, to, for us to give back to the community, the, the customers that, that have to buy our electricity. And one of our CEOs, uh, a couple of CEOs ago said, um, actually 20 years ago this year, that the most important customer for us is the one who can't pay the bill. And so we need to focus that, uh, you know, yes, we love the, the giant industrial customers and, and really want to support their work and their ESG objectives, actually. But we really do need to work every day to make sure that that customer that can't pay the bill has the resources that they need out there. In fact, our most valuable customer. So about 10 years ago, our legal department started tracking the pro bono hours that, that we did. About eight years ago, in 2014, the department decided to, under the uh, leadership of our general counsel, Marcus Brown decided to come up with department guidelines for pro bono and, and form a pro bono committee. And then about four and a half years ago, uh, general counsel and those on the committee decided that um, although our program was growing and thriving and maturing, they really wanted to give it a shot in a different way. And that was to hire a full-time attorney to be pro bono counsel, and that's me. And so I was running a nonprofit, as Jim uh, suggested. I had been law firm practice before that and really just felt led to, 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 to get this or to try to get this opportunity. And, and thankfully it all worked out. Uh, the way that our general counsel did it, FYI for those in the corporate community, he didn't uh, create a new FTE, he basically took a litigation slot that wasn't filled at the time and asked that litigation head if he could use that slot to see if, if we could start to have a pro bono counsel role. I just know sometimes it's important to mention that little bit of logistics in case that uh, sends off a spark in somebody's head um, that you might not even have to create a whole new position, so to speak, you may be able to use that slot um, in a different way. So our program back uh, back a few years ago before I got here, as I said, it was really thriving, growing. I think that most of our opportunities came about, though, because, like, say, Wendy is on the board at the Pro Bono Project, and they're having a notary clinic. Can we staff the clinic? And that's fantastic. And our attorneys and staff really enjoyed working on those matters, and they still do. We still staff. Uh, staff rather clinics every other week, every month, it, depending on the locale. Um, there's there's something always going on in that realm. But when Marcus, our general counsel and our leadership created the pro bono counsel position, they had a vision. And, and really, I, I like the way that John put it, it really felt there was a business imperative for us to start to think as a company and as a department about how to add more sustainable value for all of our stakeholders through our volunteer efforts. They wanted a more intentional, a more deliberate approach to pro bono. And that's why they created this position. And um, so what I do every day is work with internally with folks all over the company to try to find pro bono work and cultivate pro bono work and help our community members by looking at what are our company's goals? What are our strategies? What are we, investing time and resources in outside of pro bono within say social impact or corporate social responsibility, what are our company's priorities? And they, at Entergy, they happen to be education, workforce development, poverty solutions, and the environment. So what I do is try to measure our program's success, not just by the hours that we've captured 
or how many people that we've helped, although that's incredibly important. But even if we just help one person to think about the social impact and, and what what effect that can have on that person, that customer, that family, that community. And, and so we really try to look at the program in that way. And of course, access to justice being the primary focus. Uh, you know, education, workforce development, poverty solutions, the environment, all kind of lend itself toward access to justice, whether it's criminal justice, civil justice, economic justice. And so what I try to do, especially as pro bono counsel, and it doesn't take a position like B to do this, but if you are the pro bono head or the chair of the committee or on the committee, really just talking about your pro bono program within the way your business already talks about social impact, the way that it already talks about its objectives. Uh, chances are a project is gonna fit into one of those four buckets for us. And so what I try to do again, when I'm talking about these projects internally and externally is use, you know, make sure that they were furthering the company's priorities, but that we're also using the same language that our leadership uses when it comes to talking about business and social impact and ESG. I think a good example of the maturing of our program is uh, one of our things that we're most proud of. We've called, it's called the power to serve. And I always like to say we love an electricity pun um, within our industry. We just love it. So the power to serve. So that is a that is a program that we work with corporate social responsibility to identify nonprofits that we work with regularly or even help to fund to see who might need board positions filled. Then what we do is we train our employees and we open it up to all of our employees. You could be an executive, you could be a lineman or a line woman who works, you know, works out in the field every day. And we can train that person. The legal department as volunteers trains our employees how to be a good board member. What does it mean to be a board member? What are your duties there? And so then what we do is work again with CSR to connect these employees who have been trained with our nonprofits that are already a community of partners. Uh, we have a guy, Nick, in the legal department, and he went through our training. He also was um, found, he said he was interested in education and children's opportunities. And so we paired him at the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. He is on their board now. He provides pro bono work to them uh, as part of his board role and as a volunteer from Entergy. And so that's, I think, a good way to, to see how it kind of can all come together if you have a really intentional or deliberate approach. Um, our, our intentional program can also, uh, it's also tied to our company's priorities when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. I work regularly with the DEI Council at Entergy to, to make sure that our projects are supporting the company's efforts in a bigger sense. And I guess what I would say to, to you guys is kind of who are the people in your company that think about this that think about SDGs, that even know what they are, right? What is ESG? And think about the people within your company that talk about this every day, that think about this every day. And then maybe let them know what y'all have going on pro bono wise. And, and maybe there's a way for you to work together, whether it's, again, maybe using some of the language that are your, your investor relations folks are using externally, or whether it's talking to somebody from the OCE internally about the program. I think it's just a matter of figuring out who in your company, again, eats, sleeps, and breathes the SDGs and ESG, and really figuring out how to use your pro bono program, of course, to help people, of course, but then also as a business imperative, as John said, and that's exactly how our general counsel puts it too, is really just to kind of make sure that our volunteer efforts are coinciding with, with, with those objectives. So within our legal team, um, I'm, I'm on the lead team, and so I do meet monthly with our deputy general counsel who runs the department and also the heads of the various uh, departments like litigation, regulatory. I'm just explaining this to you in case there's some segment of it that kind of fits into your corporate model when it comes to for furthering your um, your program. We do have a community service and pro bono committee. Uh, we try not to make it just strictly pro bono. We try to include a good component of community service as well. And then outside of legal, I meet with our CSR folks more than weekly. Uh -huh. 
probably every other day or so I have some kind of contact with them, but we have a regular Monday meeting. I also have a regular Monday meeting with our sustainability team and our corporate communications team. Just a quick check-in. What do we have going on this week? What do y'all have going on? You have a, you know, you have a big financial conference at EEI at um, the Edison Electric Institute, or, you know, what do we have going on? We have a, an industry-wide day of pro bono service. How can we all work together to make sure that we're helping as many people as possible? I also help with um, some of our external reporting like DJSI, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and then also Civic 50 and the integrated report, trying to think of how, again, to promote our pro bono efforts within within that community as well. So those are just some of the things that I do. I realize that um, not everybody can have a full-time attorney in this role. I think though, the, if you're interested in learning more, certainly let me know. Our general counsel, as Jim knows, is definitely willing to hop on the phone with anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, otherwise, just hoping that, that, that we can use this discussion today to elevate pro bono across the board and talk about, like they said earlier, all those partnerships, whether it's internally within your company or externally through NLADA or your outside law firms that you use all the time, um, just kind of elevating and in nonprofits, wonderful nonprofits like Kind, to elevate pro bono within your company. And with that, I think it's probably a good progression to turn it over to Hardy. Thank you, Christy. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and a nod to Christy's um, hometown of New Orleans, one of my favorite um, uh, sayings um, when I think about the work that we do is um, from uh, Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire, as many of you might recall, it ends at, at the end, it's, um, Blanche Dubois says, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. And I feel like in my work at Kind and in the nonprofit world for years, that speaks very well to what we do. Uh, we try to make a lot of good happen in the world, but we have to depend on the kindness of um, the Christies, the Jims and the Johns and the Joannes of the world. And we are incredibly grateful for um, that kindness. At, at Kind, we serve uh, migrant children. For the last 14 years or so, we have worked to um, service and, and be there for children who are the most vulnerable. These are children who have fled some trauma in their home countries, whether it's a war in Ukraine or gang violence in Central America, and they are traveling either alone or with someone who's not their legal guardian. And these children tend to be the most vulnerable. And so when we were founded by Microsoft and Angelina Jolie 14 years ago, that has been our, our North Star, and we continue to focus on that um, exclusively um, today. So in a kind and in my prior roles, I've recognized the importance of having really strong pro bono partners. We can't do the work um, without um, the, the likes of the Jim, John, Joannes, and, and Christy on, on the call here. Um, and there are several ways that we partnered with um, uh, our corporate partners uh, at Kind. And in my other roles, I've seen a number of variations. So I'll just tick off a few of those and, and give a, a and try to make them uh, more real with examples. The first is the obvious one. And John alluded to this, which is, you know, pro bono work. Um, so um, that's, that's our bread and butter at Kind. We're providing legal and psychosocial services. And so um, being to, able to pair up with law firms and corporate partners is really important to our work. And we try to, and I did this in my prior job at Human Rights First, is try to team up our law firms with their clients um, so that law firms plus their, um, their corporate clients um, team up together to work on asylum cases or various immigration matters. And there, what we've realized is you, you get the opportunity of the law firm and its corporate partner uh, becoming even closer and, and because they, they work together, if there has to be a change in the, on the team, um, you've, got, you've got some sort of redundancy built in, and there are a lot of different skill sets that can be leveraged. So we do, when, when we can, um, to team up um, law firm and corporate partner. The other, um, some of the other ways that we've partnered with corporations um, are tech innovation. So we do a lot of work, obviously, with Microsoft. And when earlier uh, this year, we were thinking about how to do a digital transformation at Kind. That is, how do we use technology more thoughtfully to reach migrant children in places that are not easy to get to, either because they're not near a large city or because that child or their sponsor has no means to uh, get to a large city and to a lawyer. We've used We've leveraged technology more and more. And when we wanted to do that, we turned to Microsoft and Microsoft turned around and handed us a, a number of resources, including um, individuals on their um, uh, uh, on one of their teams 
who served as sort of counsel to us, who helped us think thoughtfully about this dig digital transformation to the point that when it was time for us to hire a CTO, uh, Microsoft embedded staff on our interview panels. And so when we were doing our interviews, um, we were asking the right questions because we had technology experts with us who, who helped us um, call through the list of candidates, focus on the right questions, and, I, and, and at the end of the day, pick the right individual. Uh, and that we couldn't have done that alone. Uh, another means of support that we've had for Microsoft and some other corporate partners is we've had companies reach out to us and say, you know, we're going to go to Capitol Hill or we're meeting with such and such policymaker. Uh, are there issues that are relevant to you at Kind that we could bring up for you? And how, and how can we do that? And we recognize that's not for everyone. But in those instances, we've been able to draft talking points and hand it um, to that corporate partner as they go to the White House or uh, a, a state house. And they've had um, some sense of the issues that we care about. And to the extent that they were comfortable and they have a relationship with that, that policymaker, they can bring up those issues. And, and if nothing else, they teed it up for us um, to continue that conversation with that policymaker. A, another uh, way we partnered uh, with corporations is um, sometimes they've provided us with hardware. So we've had, I had one instance when I was at Human Rights First where Google was piloting a particular piece of hardware and they said, we'd love to give it to you so that you can use it. And this was the Nest Hub and we ended up placing it in a conference room where we were interviewing asylum seekers, many of whom do not speak English as their first language. And so we would speak in English, the Nest Hub would translate for the client in their native language and then back. And so that allowed us to cut down on trying to find a translator and the expenses of that, while also giving Google useful feedback as to how this was working in real time. And so that sort of a partnership really helped both of us. Uh, another way is um, oftentimes we need space. So we've turned to companies and said, we're going to have a retreat in Montgomery. Do you, can we use your office space there? And companies have also thrown in lunch, and, and which is for us really important. If you're having a two-day meeting, you need to eat. And a lot of times we don't have the resources to really make that happen. And for a, a, a company to open up their office space and allow us to use that and provide a meal, that really is something that is of, of great use to us. And we truly appreciate that. Uh, another opportunity is uh, employment opportunities for our clients. Um, years ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with um, the team at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce here in D.C., and they flagged for us a number of needs that their members had um, on the employment side. And so we then set up a system by which we would identify clients of ours that had a skill set that, say, Marriott needed. And with the chamber, we were able to connect with Marriott and find some of our clients' um, employment opportunities. Um, and, and in some instances, the corporate clients were able to screen resumes and help our clients improve their resumes, do, um, do mock interviews with them. And that's a real tangible benefit to someone who is new to this country, who's looking to get their foot in the door and get their feet under them. Um, that makes a, a, a significant difference when it comes to issues of justice and equality um, to be able to get a job. And so we've had uh, uh, clients, uh, corporation partners help us with that. And then, of course, there is, um, you know, free tickets or invitations to events or occasions that we would not otherwise have access to. Um, we have a, a, a law firm partner that would do a annual trial academy for their young lawyers. And at my nonprofit that I was working in, I had a lot of long, young lawyers who didn't have much trial experience. And that law firm said, send them. So put them on a train to Philly. They could participate in this week-long trial academy, and they'll get all of the experience that our young associates get. And that was something worth thousands of dollars. And now when in impact litigation and we're facing you know, the, a, a, a large entity or the government I, I can have confidence that my second year nonprofit associate can get up on his or her feet and do well because they were, you know, they got to go to the trial academy sponsored by Blank Rome in Philadelphia. Um, that 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 was an extremely wonderful gift to us um, that um, we otherwise could not set up or afford. Uh, along the lines of events and 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 tickets to them, we've had partnerships with sports leagues, for example, uh, the NBA has given us tickets to the games where our child clients are able to attend. Major League Soccer has taken our clients onto the field and into the owner's box. 
And that's, you know, it allows a, a child who's gone through a lot of trauma to just have some fun and be a child once again. And that, you can't understate that. Um, and those are the, again, things that we don't normally have access to, um, but whether it be a trial academy, free games, or, um, uh, uh, you know, free paraphernalia, those are the things that can really make a difference in the lives of some of the people that we have the privilege of serving. And so when, when I think of this, I, I obviously know a lot of the value of, of these services that corporations provide to nonprofits. And I think for, for the corporations, I, there's some good for them here as well in that they get to do good and do well at the same time, uh, as well as burnish their brand and, and really get their name into the community. And it's also a more integrated form of CSR, that it, it allows the corporations to really think holistically about how to engage with their community. And the other thing that we've seen is that it's an outlet for corporate staff to engage in their communities, to really you know, roll up their sleeves and be a part of the community so that um, the company is thriving and, and, and the, co the community that they're working in is thriving as well. I think Jim, Jim touched on that um, uh, earlier. And, and for us, one of the major benefits is, you know, we have that expertise, we have expanded resources, but it also it gives us, it opens doors for us to be able to say, we have a partnership with, you know, HPE, the people go, oh, well, if that's the case, then maybe we should talk some more about how we could be of service to you. Like, like I, we've noticed that corporations want to be in like company. So to be able to say we have a partnership with company X and a company Y might say, well, let's let's talk some more. So those are, are some of the ways that we've engaged our, our corporate partners at Kind and some other organizations I've worked with. Um, it, there's no limit to the possibilities. It's really a matter of just sitting down um, and trying to think creatively about what can be done. And, and oftentimes some really wonderful um, possibilities uh, can, can come about. And, um, and they're all the sorts of possibilities that, that make a difference to those that we serve. Uh, so just wanted to share those ideas and uh, th thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity, Jim. Terrific, thanks so much, Hardy, and thanks, Christy. Really uh, terrific insights and such great work you all are doing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, our finalist, our final panelist, excuse me, is uh, Joanne Wallace, who again is at the NLAD Mutual Insurance Company. And Joanne, I'm going to ask you now to share some thoughts on business practices that we can consider and think about uh, further to access to justice. Sure. Thank you, Jim. First, I want to say that I'm very excited to be here today and about the launch of NLADA Mutual, which is the new business model for the NLADA insurance program. The, it's really thrilling, the new partnership with NLADA and new opportunities to lead and support conversations like these. So NLADA Mutual is very pleased to be America's equal justice insurance and risk management firm and the NLADA's com community's advocate in the insurance industry. We are going to be sending um, some material around about our new company um, in January to the Corporate Advisory Committee, uh, Jim. And, um, but for now, let me just say that the NLADA Mutual Insurance Company is a risk retention group that will be owned and governed by policyholders. In other words, the members of the NLADA equal justice community. So it means greater control of this new model and the ability to meet the unique needs of the full spectrum of the NLADA equal justice communities, so not civil legal aid and public defense, of course, but also corporate and law firm pro bonos and other nonprofits. Um, and very exciting that all net proceeds from this new entity remain in the NLADA community. So more to come. So, of course, as we've been standing up NLADA Mutual, our first focus is on making sure that we're providing the quality coverages at fair prices that members need and curated risk management services. But we've also spent a lot of time this first year exploring our own environmental, social, and governance engagement. We believe that business can and should be a force for good and to lead on justice and equity issues in particular. So for NLADA Mutual, that work that we've done this past year has really has translated into three priorities for 2023. 
So the first priority is to demonstrate our commitment to justice and equity in our internal operations and in our governance structure. So as NLADA's business partner, we believe we have a great opportunity and in fact, a responsibility to make sure that we are operating consistent with NLADA's high purpose mission. And that we have a responsibility to model the way that socially responsible business practices and specifically those in the insurance industry can advance justice and equity. This means aligning our business operations with the underlying goals of creating a more inclusive, equitable and regenerative economy and an environment where all stakeholders feel valued and prioritized. So we think that just like our services should benefit, um, uh, our services benefit the advocates that we that we provide pol insurance to and the clients that they represent. Our business should benefit and value our staff and our partners, and make sure that our products and services also reflect those values. This includes reasonable efforts to make to supporting financial security, health, wellness, safety, and the professional development of our staff. Our second priority is to serve inside the industry as an equal justice advocate. In the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, we saw that the business community really increased its focus on the ways that their operations and governance impact justice and equity for all stakeholders, right? Employees, customers, communities they serve, as we've been hearing, you know, suppliers and shareholders. In the insurance industry in particular, we've been examining the intersection of race and insurance through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Special Committee on Race and Insurance. And that history, as I'm sure some folks know, um, the history of race and insurance in the United States is, is troubling, it's a troubling one. Um, after all, it was we, the insurance industry insured slaves as property. And that troubled past has often translated into barriers in the insurance for insurance in insurance coverage for low-income communities and communities of color especially for individuals who have been justice impacted. So NLADA Mutual has launched activity to better understand how that intersection of insurance, race, and equity really, how it, how it works, right? And we've launched a, uh, we've launched an initiative to, understand, to not only understand it, but to think about how we can take that learning and be responsive to improving the industry. So for example, we sponsored a session at the 2022 NLADA annual conference on that topic, insurance, race, and justice. And we brought together community advocates from the NLADA leadership, as well as experts from American Family Insurance, from Milliman, a national actuarial firm, um, and to have a conversation about this. Um, and NLADA Mutual is co-sponsoring with American Family Insurance, another convening in 2023 with those insurance professionals and others in order to really get dive into these issues more deeply. An inability to access insurance can have a significant impact on people's lives and really affect their ability to feel safe and secure or to, and it can foster or inhibit economic opportunity. So as we've been talking to the NLADA community about, the, about these issues, we've been begun identifying them and in fact cataloging them. Um, and some of those examples include uh, the denial of car insurance. You know, if you can't afford, if you have fines and fees that you can't afford to pay, in many jurisdictions, you can lose your license. And then once you lose your license, you might not be able to get insurance um, once you get it back. That becomes, you know, a black mark for the insurance industry. Of course, this could have a terrible impact on your ability to, re to find or retain employment, as well as other life-altering consequences. Um, homeowner 
insurance. Um, often with the increase of natural disasters, it can be very difficult in those disaster prone areas to get life insurance or, I mean, I'm sorry, homeowners insurance or to get insurance that is affordable. And unfortunately, um, the history of legalized housing segregation and redlining means that often that inability to access insurance is borne disproportionately by, you know, again, low income and uh, communities of color. And I, I learned recently as we've begun this journey that um, individuals with certain criminal convictions can't get life insurance for um, another, another impediment. But at the same time that there are really negative impacts from some of these, you know, historic vestiges um, in the insurance industry, the industry is also having a very positive impact on race and equity issues. So, for example, some insurance insurers have started to influence police departments to change some of their harmful practices. One example is in St. Louis, Missouri, there was a sheriff who we had a practice of high-speed chases or condoning high-speed chases to go after people accused of low-level offenses. And these high-speed chases would leave just a, in their wake, there would be incredible human uh, damage, people being injured, as well as property, collateral property damage. But despite the government officials trying to get the sheriff to change the policy and the advocacy community trying to get the policy change, it was really only when the insurer for the city and also the police department stepped in and said, look, you know, we're going to cancel your insurance if you don't change your policy. And in fact, the policy changed. So that's not, that is happening in other, that has happened in other jurisdictions as, as well. And we think that's an example that shows the tremendous potential that the insurance um, industry has to effectuate change in a positive way in terms of justice and equity. And then finally, our, our third priority is really to serve as a resource and a leader around justice and equity issues in the business community itself. So we have seen there was a recent survey actually of general counsel that was conducted by Stanford, their um, center for corporate governance that found that general counsel generally, there's a lot of support for um, you know, ESG related activities um, in the general counsel community, but also concern about, about a risk. And so, you know, if you think about it, the insurance insurance is a data-driven industry and it's all about managing risks. So one of the ways that we, one of the things we've been thinking about is how can the insurance industry really leverage that information in order to be, play a role in helping to manage and, and ideally mitigate risks that might be associated with justice activities in the ESG space. So um, we are really have been thrilled to be part of these conversations and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the conversation today and look forward to the partnership having great impact going forward. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joanne. Thanks for sharing more about your terrific work. It's really fantastic and congrats on all you've done in a reasonably short period of time. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap up here with a, a bit of a lightning round, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to, to think on and offer up any tips or advice or lessons learned or other things people in the audience should be thinking about as they're considering public and private partnerships, maybe what's worked well, what's not worked well, or what, what things should people be considering as they listen to all of us and uh, consider what partnerships might make sense for them and for their different organizations. Um, so uh, if I may, John, I think I'm gonna go back to you to start this yeah. off and just uh, hand you the mic and see if you have any tips, lessons, thoughts, advice, et cetera. Well, I, I would say that the one thing that, you know, I've certainly learned over the last few years is the importance of casting a broad net inside your organization as you think about what you want to do and, and where you want to participate. Um, 
<clears throat> as indicated in my background, I spent a fair amount of time in private practice before going into the corporate world. And, um, you know, I think when we started down the path of thinking about pro bono in the areas that we wanted to support, et cetera, we tended to focus on the leadership team inside the legal organization. And, you know, over time rapidly, you know, over time we come to recognize that really we had to focus, A, throughout the entirety of the organization, because we had perhaps um, tenure bias in terms of where we sat and the time we had spent in the law. And there were a lot of things that folks who were newer to the law, you know, thought were important and wanted to focus on that really maybe were different than where we were going. And, and that was important. The other piece is that we've had, uh, certainly outside the U.S., but also inside the U.S., uh, a fair amount of interest and support from folks in non-legal organizations to participate in the things we do. Uh, and in many instances, there are things that are really don't require a law degree in order to go do the work um, to support what is maybe fundamentally you know, a legal-related issue. And so you know, my organization, as it grew, it became much broader than legal. We've had lots of crossover from other parts of the organization to support some of the um, instances, you know, some of the things, whether it's things around stop slavery, uh, you know, um, responsible supply chain, you know, we can go down the list. So I'd say make sure you cast a broad net within your own organization and think about folks outside your organization who may, in the first instance, not be thinking about partnering with you, but actually see the opportunity, given how well organized and well focused a lot of what the legal side is doing, and sometimes in comparison to some of the other spaces. So th those would be my uh, my tips. Great, terrific advice. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Christy, could I go back to you and just see if you have any tips, advice, lessons learned for the group? Sure. Um, and just to build off of what John said, if you do have a pro bono committee or a task force or something at your company, don't don't be afraid if there seems to be a good partnership between you and another uh, pocket of people within your company. Don't be afraid to add them to your committee or your task force. Um, we have a person from corporate social responsibility on our pro bono committee within the legal department. We're getting ready, I think, to add a slot for a retiree. Uh, to try to get some of the retirees involved. And then also uh, we have a pocket of lawyers in our finance department and we're, I think, looking to get them involved as well. So just to echo what John said, I think that's a really smart approach and, um, and we've seen some success there. As far as lessons learned, I would say, especially from the corporate perspective, never underestimate the value of those external partnerships, especially outside counsel. Um, and Morgan Lewis actually is a good example of, you know, I, I've, I've learned that if I call them and say, hey, our DC attorneys really want to work on something different, they, they enjoy working uh, with, with veterans, then uh, they just run with it. I, I think uh, in Duggan's Ren and in Texas and elsewhere, we just have all these, these great firms that we partner with on a daily basis. And the idea of just uh, trying to, to do something or build something on your own can seem kind of overwhelming when you're in-house, I think. But if you just contact somebody at, you know, at, at outside counsel and see um, they have the experience in setting up law clinics and, um, and, and representation, and they also have the capacity and the resources to put toward it. So I do like what Hardy said earlier about partnering with outside counsel. I think that you know, of course, the, the ultimate goal would be to come together to help a nonprofit together so that, so that, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting you and your outside counsel should just have a legal clinic. I think the best thing, though, is to go ahead and partner with the nonprofit, but don't forget about that. That first phone call could be to a law firm that, that you know already and, and, and think fondly of, and maybe find out who, uh, I usually try to find out who the relationship partner is before I do that just to be sure I'm not just throwing darts at the board, uh, you know, just calling up the switchboard. I think it's not a bad idea to find out um, who are we working with right now as a company? Who are our top 10 outside council spends? Uh, what about locally, regionally? Who are we using? And then just really leveraging those relationships. Um, I think that, you know, our, our attorneys in-house enjoy it more when they get to partner with external counsel that they, they're just, used to talking deals with the people they're used to talking litigation but really to help a family together or to handle an asylum case like Hardy said that's just 
they just enjoy it that much more. So that's what I would say lessons learned is don't underestimate the value of those external partnerships. Terrific, thanks Christy, very good advice. Um, Hardy, could I go back to you? I'd love uh, any additional tips, advice, lessons learned, et cetera, from your very unique perspective as a, as a nonprofit partner in this work. Jim, I think the, the one thing that comes to mind is the importance of listening. Oh. Sorry, can you hear me okay, Jim? Okay. Yeah. I'm right. so saying the, the importance of, um, of listening. I think a, a lot of the ideas that I talked about earlier came because of a, a dialogue between the corporate partner and the nonprofit. And oftentimes it wasn't, the goal wasn't to come up with X, it was, it happened more organically that the corporate partner called and said, I remember when we spoke three months ago, you were really struggling with translation issues. I think I have an idea for you. And that, that organic nature comes about by having many conversations and and finding ways to talk and to listen to one another um, so that the corporate partner becomes sort of you know an active member almost like a member of your board an extension of your organization and at the same time that we on the nonprofit side can be thinking about well what is the what is our corporate partner what's their priorities how can we be of service to them because you know, it's truly a a, a symbiotic two-way street but in order for that to really work well and to have that organic nature, I think you have to be in constant conversation with one another. Um, and that I'm not saying weekly, but you know, once every two or three months, just sitting down and 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 whether it's over Zoom or, or coffee in person, just saying what, what's on your mind, what's keeping you up at night. Um, so that way you're creatively partnering with, with one another to think through solutions. Great. Love that. Thanks so much, Hardy. And Joanne, maybe I could go back to you. Just uh, any tips, thoughts, advice, lessons learned, et cetera, over the course of your career on this subject of public-private partnerships. Welcome your, your thoughts. Sure. Well, I will say that one of the lessons learned in my short time as being the head of NLAD's business affiliate is really maybe a lesson relearned, which is how important it is to have the voice of the people who are actually being impacted by the justice system or the policy or practice that you're that you're trying to change at the table with you and and guiding your um, guiding your efforts. Um, it has been incredibly important to have you know to hear from legal aid, public defense, uh, pro bono professionals about the issues that we've been exploring. But I have to say that it has been really enlightening to hear from the community advocates in the NOADA community about these insurance issues and really has brought an, a very different perspective from the professionals. Both, you know, both of the views are, are critically important. I think that's one of the strengths of the NOADA community that it does have in its leadership and governance um, structure the voice of community advocates. And I, I do believe that after, you know, especially in this era, that as we're thinking about public-private partnerships, that we have to go beyond the, the lawyers who are so used to being the voice of individuals, but actually to tap into the community itself and, and hear from the people who have been impacted or who are likely to be impacted by the work that we're trying to do. Awesome, thanks, Joanne. So um, that is uh, what we had for you all today. I just want to thank each of our panelists uh, so much again for, for joining us today. Um, I know how busy all of you are and for you to spend this time with us today and share your insights and your wisdom is, was really a gift. So thank you so much uh, to each of you. Uh, I hope everyone learned a lot. I certainly did. I was taking notes uh, furiously as you guys were uh, talking. Um, so I not only learned a lot, but I was inspired anew for the work that we're doing at U.S. Bank, um, just to hear from all of you. So thank you so much for that. So I as well just want to thank everybody in the audience for uh, joining us today and for um, listening to this conversation and uh, hopefully being inspired about uh, the work that you're hearing about, about Goal 16, about what NLADA and these other organizations are doing. It was, again, just terrific to, uh, to hear about all of it. 
So with that, I will thank all of you. Uh, April, I don't know if you had any closing words or thoughts, or perhaps we're close to adjournment. Thank you, Jim. I would like to just say thank you again to the amazing panel. Um, we have had an amazing conversation. Um, and also, I would like to encourage everyone who attended today, if you want to learn more about the Corporate Advisory Committee, please visit our website or you can reach out. You can click on the link that is provided to you in the chat. Uh, we would love to grow and engage with new CAC members. So please join us in this collective uh, fight to advance equal justice. Thank you for joining us today.